My name is Sam. I'm on a mission to make transport sustainable using the power of steam. Over the last couple of weeks I've been stuck on the drawing board finishing off some of the fine details for the new steam pumps. So I haven't had a chance to get into the workshop and make progress actually making them. So I thought it was about time I explained some of the special features of the new boiler technology and why it's different to conventional steam locomotive boilers. One of the key features of the new boiler is its ability to come up to steam very quickly. So I've set up a clock here and I'm going to use that to give an indication of how quickly the boiler can come up to steam. So conventional boilers would normally take something like three hours to raise a full head of steam and this boiler has a lot less water in it so it's possible for it to come up to steam much faster. So that not only makes it very safe, it also means that there's far less energy wasted at the end of each day and there's much less water to heat up at the start of the day to get going. Nico is going to light up the boiler for us. So time is just after 6pm. Pretty well immediately the firebox temperature is climbing. So there's absolutely no pressure in the boiler. Nico's blowing the whistle while well, trying to blow it. Fire is getting away now, but we're, we're suffering a wee bit because we had about 11 millimetres of rain last night. So the outside of the wood's a bit wet, and that just slows us down at the start here. When it's actually in service, it's very important that the light up wood is perfectly dry to, uh, to make sure that the morning start is as quick as possible. Oh, good looking fire there, Nico. Okay? I hope so. Really most of the time at this point has gone into getting the firebox temperature up and actually getting the fire to pull away. So there's a few options around speeding that up. There's a bit of water sitting in the surveyor which tends to protect it. The dark staining on the funnel is actually tannin. Because we're steaming the boiler once every two weeks, to try and protect the superheaters, I'm intentionally priming the boiler and that gets some of the treated water into the superheater and protects the metal. But what that means is when we light up two weeks later, that treated water has to go somewhere. So it ends up on the funnel. Of course, when the loco is actually in daily service or even, even weekly service, it's not necessary. Ooh, it's a lovely looking fire in there. Almost 17 and a half minutes. And you can see the saturated steam temperature is really starting to rock it up now. 20 minutes in and we have what looks like uh, 15 psi on the pressure gauge. So what I have here is a very handy bit of kit and I can read the smoke box rapid temperature with this. So it's still sitting at about 40 degrees Celsius. The boiler is making steam. The heat exchanger in this boiler is quite efficient. It actually surprised me. It's far more efficient than I expected to be or calculated it to be, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, but what it does mean is we do see very low smoke box gas temperatures. The outside of the firebox is sitting at about 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, what's the temperature in the firebox, Nico? The firebox has shown 510. Boiler the shell temperatures. The boiler is making steam at this point. Temperature is dropping off now, so Nico is going to get a couple of bits of wood in that. Time is almost 6.30. Up the temperature comes. It's actually much easier to, to light up at, at, at this temperature, isn't it? Oh, it's a lot easier. You don't get told off. <laughs> <laughs> it's awfully hard to keep it below 450. And slow. And yeah, it's almost double the time, couldn't you? Mm, yeah. So, I need two bits of wood in there, Nico. Come up to 60 psi and 30 minutes exactly. 38 minutes in and up to 100 psi. A number of viewers on YouTube have actually noticed that these are too widely spaced to be stays and 
this actually doesn't contain any water. It's not the firebox is not water walled, so stays can't break and need to be replaced. Uh, these fasteners are actually anchors, and they anchor heat resistant steel tiles to the walls of the, of the firebox and sandwich uh, ceramic fiber blanket insulation, and that keeps the heat in the firebox. The most important factor about having a dry firebox is that it ensures complete combustion of the fuel and it does that um, simply by not removing any heat until combustion is complete and that's sort of the secret to this, to this boiler burning fuel clean and also being able to burn uh, quite a lot of wood in a small space so none of the energy is being pulled out of the fire um, until it's completely finished burning and quite a lot of heat in a conventional loco boiler is transferred radiantly uh, so this doesn't do any of that, all of that heat is retained and burns the fuel perfectly. Wood has a much higher volatile content than some other fuels. So that means there needs to be a lot more volume in which to burn the fuel. So this boiler uh, actually carries a combustion chamber all the way down to this flange. So this here is combustion chamber, um, firebox, combustion chamber. So there's tons of volume in there to completely burn the wood fuel. So then from this flange ahead is where the heat is transferred to the water in the boiler. There's no water rear of that flange. Um, all of the water is contained in this section of the boiler and there's actually no pressure on the shell at all. No boiler pressure, no water against the shell. It has within that shell a water tube type of heat exchanger. And water tube boilers have been tried on steam locomotives before not successfully, but there are a lot of reasons for that. It wasn't just as simple as water tube boilers don't work on steam locomotives. So this is quite a different design to what was employed. And most of the, if not all of the water tube type boilers that were tried on steam locomotives actually included a water walled firebox. And that's a key difference here. There's no water around the firebox and that simplifies things dramatically. And you actually don't need to have water around the firebox to transfer enough heat nor do you need it to maintain equilibrium between steam production and steam consumption. So then of course forward of the main barrel where the water tube type heat exchanger is contained is a fairly conventional smoke box and it contains Porter's Lemport exhaust system which is critical to achieving the high locomotive efficiencies that this must achieve. So another key feature of this design is it's actually a forced circulation water tube boiler and what that means is there's a circulating pump to pump the boiler water around the heat exchanging tubes. Now to do that I'm using a steam driven circulating pump. Actually it's uh, perhaps over 100 years old. It's not designed for doing this at all. It's a Worthington Simpson uh, steam pump. It's designed as a feed pump. I'm not using it as that so it's just categorically the wrong pump for the job. But it works, which is a good sign. The steam pumps that I'm currently working on, and over the, in the last couple of episodes I was machining the liners for, are actually circulating pumps. They're not feed pumps, and they will be attached to each side of the smoke box, and they will pump the water around the water tube boiler. Now this type of water tube boiler with a circulating system is very similar to a Lamont type of steam boiler. They were used early on by the Navy overseas and steamships because they possessed both high steam raising capacity within a given size and fast steaming so a ship could get up to steam quickly and get on the move. Following this Lamont boilers have often been used in and I believe are still used in stationary plant for generating electricity. From what I understand this is uh, the second example of a Lamont type of boiler being applied to a steam locomotive. The first was a German locomotive referred to as H45 and it was developed near the end of steam but it included such complications as a condensing tender and pulverized coal firing. And from what I can make out, and there's very little information on this locomotive, but the combination of all of these advances in technology resulted in the overall failure of the project. So tucked just underneath the smoke box is the very temporary uh, steam circulating pump. Now this is this has been here far too long. It wasn't supposed to be on the boiler as, as long as it has been, but that's always the way these things seem to work, isn't it? You, you put something on there temporarily to get it going and it just seems to stay there. It would have been nice actually to build and fit the new circulating pump before I first steamed the boiler, but I needed more information um, 
before I could finish the design of the circulating pumps, so this was unfortunately the only way. But it's done the job. Really the main issue with it is the steam pistons are much larger than the water pistons because it was a feed pump, so it's actually designed to pump water above boiler pressure. Whereas as a circulating pump, it only needs to pump against a head of maybe 20, 30 psi at the most. So the water end pistons can be much larger than the steam end pistons. And what using a feed pump for a circulating pump means is a lot of extra steam consumption and the pump needs to run really fast to circulate enough water. So this pump actually has about a quarter of the capacity that this boiler needs. And the amount of steam it's using is almost 10 times more than the new circulating pumps will actually use in service. So when they are finally fitted to the boiler, the new circulating pumps together will use less than 1% of the steam that the boiler generates. So when I was designing this boiler, safety was a really important factor for me. And the combination of a stainless dry firebox and a low volume water tube heat exchanger has meant that this boiler cannot explode. And the boiler is carefully designed so that in the event that the water tube pressure system did actually fail, the worst possible failure that it could experience, the pressure on the boiler shell will not exceed 50 kilopascals or 7 and a quarter psi. So what that means is the exposure to operators and the public is at a level that is considered a negligible hazard by the standards that boilers are classified by in New Zealand and Australia. Now you may be wondering why have a forced circulation boiler when water naturally circulates anyway. And the reason is that forced circulation gives a lot more latitude in the design of the heat exchanger, allows it to be more compact, and allows the flow speeds of the water to be much higher. That achieves a higher heat transfer coefficient. And when you put all that together, you get a more efficient, more compact, and safer boiler. The other feature about forced circulation is by achieving a higher flow velocity, all the time, it basically results in continuously washing out the boiler. So this is why this boiler, um, as some of you have noticed, doesn't have washout plugs. There's, there's nothing to wash out. It's actually continuously washing itself out. Periodically some of that material is blown down. The porter treatment of course plays an important role in enabling all of that to work. It keeps the, the scale soft. So the combination of porter treatment and forced circulation is key to this boiler being very low maintenance. A fellow member at the Canterbury Steam Preservation Society was cleaning up their garage the other day, their moving house, and he had this steam pump, uh, which he's very kindly donated to the project for me to use as a, a temporary feed pump on the boiler. Uh, so thank you, Miles, very much for donating this to the project. I'm going to strip it down now, uh, have a look at its internal condition to see what needs to be done. It's, it hasn't run for a long time long time. I don't know what its history is, but it's, it's about the right size, so uh, we'll see how it looks and hopefully set it up on the boiler soon. Now this is a duplex type of steam pump. How it works, this is the steam end, and this is the water end. Uh, there are pistons in here, well pistons in both end of course, steam pistons, water pistons. Under this cover are the valve decks, which have the suction and discharge valves. Um, check valves or one-way valves. Under this cover are the uh, steam valves which distribute steam to the steam cylinders and control the piston going back and forth. So these will be slide valves in this pump and what happens is one side of the pump, so this piston rod here, controls the valves for the other piston and then this side controls the valves for the other side. So quite a clever arrangement. Now these pumps were really common as general service pumps on ships uh, when they were powered by steam. They're not particularly efficient because there's no expansion of the steam in the cylinders. The steam continues flowing into the cylinders uh, really for the whole length of the stroke, but for what they are, they are quite effective.
the pump mostly in pieces and unfortunately it doesn't look too good. The cylinders have been left with water in them at some point. Now I've scratched this back, I'm not sure how that'll come up with a bit of work. The water end is quite interesting, it's a type of plunger pump. These are actually the plungers and they move in and out. And these here are sort of like liners, well not liners but bushes in which these plungers operate. So quite easy to replace when they become worn. But they're held in by studs which a most unusual design, look quite awkward to remove and due to the method of fastening the studs are all bent. On a first look the valves look okay although the springs are very strong. I should be able to lift the lid on these and I, I can't. This is Philip. Uh, Philip's out here today and I'm giving him some tips on TIG welding. Now Philip's uh, devoted a lot of time to giving me some business mentoring over the last few months and this is the least I can do uh, to thank him for, for all that time he's spent. You know? Yeah, it feels a bit like dragging you off your project, but it's uh, nice to get a few tips from a pro and uh, always fun to spend time in the workshop. Yeah, the mentoring is, it's not really mentoring, it's just that discussion as to how, how to progress the project for, for achieving that goal of having live steam back in productive work. And uh, yeah, Sam's already well, well, well down the path but uh, it's really exciting bringing more people in from the public and letting people join the project mm. um, online with the videos you're making and with Patreon, which is um, really exciting because already we can see the difference with having some donations of equipment and also um, a bit of money coming in, which really does speed things up. Mm, that's right, and so as you've probably picked, uh, Philip's been quite instrumental in me taking the project online and, and sharing it with everyone uh, which so far has been a, a really good thing to do um, so looking forward to seeing how, how it pans out yeah it's really exciting how many people are, are both watching it but also getting involved yeah. Yeah. It. Yep. So, does it work yeah oh, i didn't oh there it goes it's gone back yep excellent that's going better I've just finished off the drawing for the steam pump bracket. Uh, now, I was working on this a little while ago. Had to put it on the back burner for some time. I've now finished it and I've got to dimension it up and then I can put together some orders to have the various profiles laser cut out, which just saves me a lot of time in the workshop. So there's two of these steam pumps to be mounted on each side of the boiler and they're located in a position such that they don't interfere with any other component or working of the locomotive. It's actually taken me a long time to locate these pumps. There's so many places that they can be installed and it's trying to look into the future and just see what design changes might be made to the locomotive and how this might work on future locomotives that are larger or smaller. There we are, all done. I'm tidying up some of the design details for the uh, steam pump. And one of the issues I've got is I've changed the piston rod material specification. It was going to be um, 304 stainless steel, which I wasn't that happy with, but it did mean I could weld the piston rod directly to the steam piston. One issue with the 304 stainless is the coefficient of thermal expansion, so the amount that uh, the material expands per degree Celsius of temperature rise or change is about... Oh, not quite double that, but significantly higher than steel. So where the piston rod was attached to the water end piston, it's quite a long attachment, and the water end piston is made of um, mild steel. So there was going to be quite a difference when that heated up. It would tend to loosen the piston on the rod, which isn't ideal. So one way to solve that is to use a Martin Sittick grade of stainless steel such as 420 stainless steel but 420 stainless steel doesn't lend itself to welding um, and there's a risk of cracking in the heat affected zone if I don't treat it just just right so what I'm investigating now is actually shrinking the piston rod onto the piston this is the drawing of the steam piston assembly and the original design included these welds so the rod would be welded from each side into the piston with the 420 stainless steel I'd rather not weld it. So the idea is to machine this rod larger than the bore in the piston. 
Now, of course, that means the rod won't fit in the piston. So to assemble it, the piston is heated up to around two, 300 degrees Celsius, which causes it to expand. The hole or bore in the piston becomes larger than the diameter of the rod. The rod can be dropped in and the assembly left to cool down. And when it does that, the, the piston should tightly grip the rod. But to check whether it's actually going to grip the rod tight enough, I've got a very handy online calculator that I can use to check the stress in the piston and the rod and the friction force that will be generated as a result of the shrink fit. That'll tell me whether or not it can actually transmit the piston thrust that is going to result from full steam pressure on one side of the piston. This is the very handy online calculator. Thank you Engineering ABC, it's most useful. The parameters are entered here and this is the the amount of interference between the piston rod and the piston, so how much larger than the hole is the piston rod. In this case I've set that at 0 0.03 millimeters over size and that has resulted in a friction force of almost 25 kilonewtons. The piston thrust due to steam pressure is only 14 kilonewtons, so this will work and then checking the stress in the piston it shows is 208 megapascals which is okay it's less than the yield strength and in the rod is also okay that tells me it's going to work that tells me what interference i must use so whilst it, it is possible to attach the piston rod to the piston with a with a conventional nut uh, arrangement it's always at risk of coming loose and the top of the piston and this particular pump does need to be flat, so there's not a lot of room. Uh, the resulting assembly would be quite short, and that limits the elasticity of the joint, so the likelihood of it actually coming loose in service is quite high. A shrink fit is simpler to make, and provided it's undertaken correctly, it's never going to come loose, and it's not going to cause any maintenance headaches. I'm just amending the drawing for the piston rod, so this tolerance will now change to suit the shrink fit uh, of this into the piston. Sorted. I'm just giving Dad a quick hand to drill some seed using a fairly ancient and uh, somewhat awesome seed drill. You can probably guess what I'm thinking. What if the power of sustainable steam could be put to work here? Now of course conventional steam tractors were too heavy for this type of work, but the new lightweight boiler technology might now make it possible. So now we're basically up to pressure. I'm going to start the circulating pump to get some water flowing through the boiler. Um, so this is the, the valve for that. Bit of condensation to blow out. Not quite an hour yet and we're ready to go for a run, aren't we? Yep. Ooh, that's a big thing. Couple of those. The, uh, the T valve, most important. I'm just going to take a sample of boiler water to test later to see that the concentration of um, water treatments within the right limits. You can see it's quite foamy. Here's the sample that I drew from the boiler tonight. It's cooled down, so I'm just going to check the pH for now. I've got these pH test strips, but the problem is I had been using uh, these indicator strips from Johnson Test Papers 
and they were quite good because the colour wasn't remotely similar to the tannin, so they weren't so affected by the, the dark colour of the water. But the Merck indicator strips are very nearly the same colour as the tannin, so I'm getting quite an error with these. I've just ordered another two packs of the Johnson indicator strips, and uh, we'll see how they go. So, uh, I simply dip the test paper in the water, swirl it for a couple of seconds, shake it off of the kitchen sink, and then compare the colour. Now intuitively, one would lay the strip down like so, but no. These indicator strips must be laid down like this, which is very awkward. The top colour basically gives the, the bulk of the indication here. Based on the fact that it's quite dark, happy that the pH is in the range of 12, which is well wanted. It must be above 11, uh, and of course we don't want it to get up to 14. I'm happy with that, but I'm I'm definitely hanging out for the uh, the Johnson indicator strips because this is a wee bit hopeless. And just see how dark it is. So the tannin is very concentrated in the water. Well, that's it till next time. Thank you for watching, and a huge thank you to everyone who is supporting the project, and in particular to the project's patrons. I really appreciate your support. Thank you for listening to your inner loco and joining the project. If you haven't already, please subscribe and do check out my page on Patreon. I'd love to have you on the team as a patron to help me on my mission to make transport sustainable using the power of steam.